So I'm going to be speaking about platform engineering as a community service. So just very briefly, uh, quickly about me. So Nikki Watt, CTO at Open Credo. Um, we're a hands-on software development consultancy, and we specialize in helping clients adapt and adopt emerging technologies to overcome complexity and deliver in three main areas. Um, one of those being platform engineering, which is very much, of course, the focus of this talk. So I've been working with a fair number of different clients and their platforms over the years. And so I have some insight into some of the things that have worked and some of the things that haven't. And something that I've observed over time is that as companies push to adopt innovative new technology platforms, they seem to have lost sight of the human innovators and the communities actually needing to use it. And for those platforms that don't quite seem to work out as planned, uh, we believe this is in large part due to the fact that there's a bit of an unhealthy focus on just the cool new innovative technology and not so much on the broader human or developer experience around it. So in this talk, I want to dig into that a little bit more and bring you some of the observations and the experiences um, on what we feel it takes to actually build a fit for purpose platform and one that manages to successfully target all the communities uh, that they aim to serve. So in terms of the agenda, uh, the first half, we're going to look just to sort of set the scene. What is platform engineering? Which communities are impacted by it? And in the last two sections, we're going to cover what the characteristics of a successful platform experience actually looks like. So what is it that we should be aiming for? And then how do you platform engineer well? And we look at some of the principles, examples, real world observations, uh, which can help us get there. So first up, uh, I think we should start with just defining what is platform engineering. So obviously, it's all about building a platform. So if we quickly define what we mean by a platform, because this means different things to different people, that's a good start. So I really like these two definitions. Um, the first one is from a guy called Evan Botcher, and he speaks about a platform as being a foundation of self-service APIs, tools, services, knowledge, and support, which are arranged as a compelling internal product. And you'll note that he emphasizes that the platform has been a foundation, not just of technology and tools, but also knowledge and support. And the second one is from uh, Matthew Skelton of Team Topologies fame. And this is probably the most concise definition that I've actually come across, which uh, encapsulates the essence of uh, what I mean in a very short statement. And here he talks about it as being um, a platform is offering a curated experience to the engineers who are ultimately the end customers of the platform. And here again, the word experience implies that it's not just the technology, but it's the whole way in which the engineers actually use the platform. So what a platform is not is, as I said, it's not just technology. And as much as people will tell you that Kubernetes is all you need, um, they are wrong. Um, and it's not just a wrapper around a, a bunch of technology as well. If you're going to create a curated experience for your users, this is going to have to include some other softer type skills as well in order to produce the, the final end result. So very briefly, um, why would you want a platform anyway? So many businesses are under pressure at the moment to try and respond to the ever more demanding customer needs. People want things bigger, faster, more available. And the same old technology just simply doesn't cut it anymore. And with new technologies and approaches being used, cloud natives Cloud Native is very much an approach that is uniquely well suited to responding to this. But the solutions are complex. They involve distributed systems. There's many microservices. And so platforms in, in part really arose to help try and tame some of the complexity and ultimately help um, companies achieve these goals more effectively. And the way they do this is by primarily looking to improve the developer productivity and efficiency. So providing your engineers with tooling, processes, ways of working, which will make their lives easier. And this is often in the operational and the infrastructure type areas. So like provisioning, setting up pipelines. But they also uh, look to provide consistency and confidence. And this is around sort of cross-cutting concerns, um, maybe ensuring that things like auto-scaling and security is done properly and reliably. And ultimately, they also land up helping really to scale teams because as the business grows with all the microservices and things, a platform is a way of, of really helping the business expand. So if we smash all of these definitions together, um, but I add my own take on things, um, I would define platform engineering as a discipline which involves doing whatever it takes. And this could be both technical and non-technical 
to build, maintain, and provide a curated platform experience for the communities using it. And you'll note that in my definition, the emphasis is not just on engineers, but it's on all of the communities who are involved. And with that, uh, we probably want to have a look at, well, who are these communities that are, that are involved? And of course, the most obvious one is the one that's already been alluded to by some of the definitions, uh, and that is your core technical teams. <clears throat> So these are often your cross-functional teams or your product teams, maybe even specialist teams. And their needs typically include uh, needing to focus on writing and delivering code with business value as fast as possible to the end users. And they really don't want to get bogged down by writing plumbing code. So for them, a good platform experience will ease their lives considerably by providing tools and service that are going to help with things like provisioning infrastructure, getting decent CI CD pipelines up and running, and generally wherever possible, minimizing the wrangling that is needed to do some of the non-business critical work. But the second and maybe less obvious group is uh, what I would call the data analysts and scientists. So at the moment with the incorporation of more machine learning um, into systems, this is not just something that is for the select few. Many businesses are actually moving in this direction. But as a result, so too has the need to improve the maturity and the operational processes and the life cycles around doing this. So no more sort of scratching around on a notepad, building a model and then just giving it to the developer to include. This whole process also needs to be incorporated into a timely and a reliable manner uh, as part of the bigger rollout. But when it comes to a, um, a platform, you can't just apply the same sort of standard DevOps processes to machine learning as you have to um, the standard engineering ones. And this is because there are some special cases. So there might be specialized hardware or software that's required. But more importantly, um, it's not just code that's involved anymore. You've now got data, you've got model parameters, you've got multiple pipelines, and all of these need versioning, tracing, and handling. So and this is really where techniques like MLOps comes to the fore. So if you're going to have a platform which is going to support this community, you also have to take these unique challenges into account as well. And finally, I would say that there's the sometimes forgotten, sometimes overemphasized community, which I will call leadership and governance. Now, there's always going to be somebody who's sponsoring this platform initiative, and they are generally going to have expectations um, about uh, things and they shouldn't be forgotten. So this is generally your sort of C-level sponsors, but it may also involve others, possibly more sort of less technical groups, like maybe your regulatory and com compliance people or your finance people. And they too are consumers of the platform, but they come at it from a completely different angle. So instead of using the nuts and bolts of the platform to produce the software art artifacts, this community is more interested in extracting valuable information out of the platform and measuring some of the benefits and the outcomes that it can provide. So for example, they might want to know like, what's my overall cloud spend? Is it still within limits? Are we meeting our security and regulatory compliance and, and stuff like that? So I guess the key point to, to recognize here is that um, you need to take all of your communities into account when you're looking to uh, start a platform engineering initiative. And whilst your feature and your product teams are probably going to be your primary users, they're not the only ones, and you ignore the other ones at your peril. So for all of these communities that we have just looked at, what does a successful platform experience actually look like? What does it feel like? And this section, we're now going to sort of dive into some of the successes, but also some of the failures that we've seen across some of our clients uh, and the platforms that they've, um, and their platforms. And we're going to take that and distill it into some key points and findings, uh, which we believe represent a good target end state that you want to aim for. So whatever you do and however you do it, if you can curate and build a platform experience which exhibits these characteristics, we believe you have a very good chance of going some way to, to actually get an overall outcome uh, that is successful. So first up, um, a successful um, experience tends to be ones where there are very clear boundaries and responsibilities established. In other words, it's very obvious what the platform does versus what the team using it does. So the team understands what is required of them and also what processes need to be followed to be a good citizen on the platform. So by drawing your lines early in the sand, um, this will minimize the frustration for the teams 
because there's also less problems that can fall between the cracks. It also helps to promote better collaboration and faster flow as there should be um, a lot less of the lost in translation type problems. Now, what does this look like if you don't have clear boundaries and responsibilities? So what we've seen in some of our clients when this is lacking is that you land up in um, either a blame game or a pass the hot potato scenario. So for example, we had um, one client where the developers, they kept getting out of memory issues but it really wasn't actually clear what um, problems were considered part of the platform and what were considered part of the team's um, sort of issues. And so debugging microservices became a bit of a nightmare. And whilst it started with just this one issue, it landed up at the end where at the first sign of trouble, no matter what the problem was, the answer from the development team was always, well, it's not our problem. The platform team has released something new, so they've probably broken it. And the platform team was saying, well, the devs don't bother to look at the logs. So, um, you know, when they've done that, then we'll get involved. And in this case, uh, the solution besides a, a lot of sort of education um, is that we needed to actually define some of the sort of categories of what are the type of errors that um, are platform related versus um, team related. And we did that in something called a, a platform contract, which is something that I'll, I'll talk about moving forward. But basically, if you want to maintain a healthy relationship between your platform and your users, you, you really do need to make sure that you've got very clear boundaries uh, about uh, where the responsibilities lie. So following this, um, I'd say one of the single most top desires that users have of a, a platform is to have a self-service capability. And this is often through a combination of clearly defined interfaces, docs and processes but ideally they want this to be um, as automated as much as possible. Why? Um, because it provides them with the tools and the means to achieve what they need to do independently, and it allows them to go as fast as they're able to go, essentially controlling their own destiny. So with no friction from the platform team to get going, this also encourages them to, to innovate and experiment as well. Now, if you don't have this, and we've seen this again in, in some of our clients, you land up in what I would call the death by a thousand Jira tickets. So at one place uh, we were at, in terms of trying to raise uh, infrastructure requests, you had to raise about five or 10 different Jira requests, all in the right order, in order for people to create the machines and the databases for you. And Jira it does not classify as self-service uh, unless you actually have a fully automated process at the back of it. So don't be confused. Um, but we've all been there um, where outcomes are very slow and the lead times to get anything done are extremely long. So aiming for self-service automation should be extremely high on, any, on every platform engineering teams list. Thirdly, um, you should really aim for both the technology and the processes uh, provided through the platform to be flexible and evolvable. So whilst the platform needs to be opinionated enough to ensure that there's order, uh, it does need to be tailored to adapt to the different communities, to their needs, but also to allow for some deviation if required, because otherwise your platform just becomes a bottleneck. So by definition, this means you can't offer a, a one size fits all for everybody. It just doesn't work. So really what you should be aiming for is to provide people with guardrails and guides. And this can be through things like templates and stuff like that, which will really help to steer engineers in the right direction and ensure that they don't veer off track, but without completely boxing them in. And crucially, it must be fit for purpose. So this is where the platform will address the very real user concerns that people have and not just any and every theoretical one that people read in books and that they listen to at conferences. So most people are not Google and Facebook and so your team should not try to blindly emulate what they've done. So just because Google runs everything in containers doesn't mean you need to either. So, you know, if being able to easily request and get access to new and coming cloud specific resources for experimentation is something that's important to you, then that's the type of flexibility that you should explicitly plan and build into your platform. So what happens when this doesn't uh, work out as planned? So if, if um, the sort of worst thing is that you get rogue teams that actually bypass your, your, your platform and this just becomes, your platform becomes a white elephant. But actually, probably a worse scenario is where 
the teams will actually stay within the artificial boundaries that you've created, but they find ingenious but completely inappropriate ways to make their stuff work. So again, uh, by way of an example, we had uh, one client who had an OpenShift cluster and the only actions that were a, sort of open to the team at the time was that they could create stuff in the cluster, but they were not allowed to access any of the cloud services uh, in, in the native cloud, which is Amazon at the time. Um, so the architectures that the teams landed up putting together put everything into OpenShift and that included databases, messaging systems, even where they should have been shared. And in reality, actually consuming some of the cloud native services would have been better, but because the pain and the inability of the platform to allow them to do that uh, was, was so great, they landed up working around it and they came up with a real suboptimal solution. So the key here is really to make it a priority to have a, a platform that can grow and evolve to handle both the diverse needs of the communities as well as reasonable evolutions within those communities as well. And finally, um, it will be all for nothing if your communities and your teams can't actually rely on what's being built. So your platform has to be reliable both for your day one activities, but also for day two, the operational uh, concerns beyond that. So whilst developers and engineers are not wanting to understand the details of how to manage low level auto scaling and blue greening and stuff like that, if they actually configure their systems to auto scale, they will expect it to happen. And so um, the experience needs to ensure that all of the fundamental capabilities are rock solid so that it can provide confidence to your engineers and your operational staff and management. And this will also include things like tooling and dashboards uh, to provide help when issues arise. And this is regardless of whether it's sort of development or production uh, when people need troubleshooting. So if the platform itself is not reliable, besides having unhappy teams, you will inevitably have unhappy clients because the, the, the end result will just be um, uh, disastrous probably. But if the tools that you give your, your engineers to actually manage the platform are unreliable, then you land up in a slightly different scenario where teams start building their own coping mechanisms. And you land up having many little ecosystems that start evolving. So again, um, one of the areas where we saw this happening in a client was, um, well, one of the clients, they landed up actually building their own entire customized logging and tracing system. And this was because the, the developers were trying to debug uh, stuff that was going on, but the platform team hadn't given them access or insight to be able to see all the necessary logs that they needed. So they landed up scraping things from all over the show and then they built their own system to try and figure out how to actually debug. And they essentially um, landed up uh, doing the exact opposite of what the platform was meant to do, i.e. allow developers to work on the business critical stuff. They, stand, they landed up actually building uh, the, the core sort of plumbing stuff. So whatever you do, I'd say don't uh, sort of stint and scrape on the reliability side of thing as this is a, a surefire way to sync your initiative before uh, it's even gotten going. So you say, okay, well, great. So we know what kind of system we're aiming for, but what are the sort of practical things that we can now do to actually get there? So first up, um, I just want to define a prerequisite or an assumption on my part. And that is that the foundation of platform success, I believe needs both executive buy-in and a sufficient level of technical expertise and experience of having done this before upfront to be successful. So I originally had a lot more in this um, in the last version of my talk, but it landed up being too long, so I had to sacrifice some stuff. But this is an important part, an uh, important point. So I'll give you the, the TLDR version. So why is it important to have executive or C-level buy-in? This is because you will ultimately need a level of authority um, on the across the project to give you permission to make some of the necessary changes that are going to be required. And these changes, as we'll see, they're not just technology, they're also around organizational structures and processes as well. And without this, your change initi initiative is really unlikely to succeed. But if there is buy-in at this level, um, then there's a real business need and hence funding um, driving it. And so there's, there's often a willingness uh, to actually do whatever it takes to make it work. And now, and of course, technically, uh, I would say that at least part of your core team 
um, and or the leadership should include technical expertise and real world experience in things like modern cloud and distributed systems. And this is very much needed to ensure that the technical approach is sound uh, and it can help you prevent you from going down sort of blind alleys and, and rabbit holes. But please note, what I'm, I'm not saying that you need to have a whole team of Google engineers and experts uh, and you can't do anything without them. Uh, but you do need to have some of these core skills present. Otherwise, uh, the road tends to be quite long with many a winding path. So um, we don't want to land up there. Anyway, assuming we've got our executive buy-in and uh, we have enough technical expertise to keep us uh, going in the right direction, I would like to suggest that what is required now is to adjust our thinking a little bit away from purely the traditional tech, uh, sort of technical as a service mental model and move more towards our communities where we aim not just to provide a service to them, but actually to be a service to them. So what do I mean by that? So, or how would you do that? Um, I would say uh, by following what I would call four basic community driven principles um, and letting these guide the practical solutions and the approaches that you come up with to solve the problems um, uh, in the platform. So, uh, uh, yeah, so there's four of them that, that we're going to cover uh, with some examples. So first of all, uh, I would say you need to make teams independent of and not dependent on you. So obviously they are going to be dependent on you as a platform to a certain extent because they're, they're using it. But what you don't want is for them to, to need you or your team personally to intervene every time they need to do something. So we're really aiming for empowerment here. So the type of things that you can do include the following. So the first thing uh, is to define uh, what I call a platform contract. So this is um, a little bit like the AWS shared responsibility model. So I'm not sure if, if you've come across this before, but basically it's a, it's a sort of a document which Amazon puts out and it defines what the areas of responsibility are for Amazon, or in this case, the platform, and what the responsibility is of the user. And some examples of, of good things that you could sort of include in here is probably around security and compliance. So for example, you could say that the platform will take responsibility for patching Kubernetes nodes, but the team needs to take responsibility for scanning their own containers for vulnerabilities uh, and stuff like that. And whilst the platform may actually provide the tools and the services to do the scanning, um, it's the team's responsibilities to incorporate those into their pipelines. Um, other areas might include things like resource handling, so if we take, for example, the example that was cited earlier about developers being unclear about what errors were platform errors versus theirs, um, we, can, we can sort of say that well, this is a bit of a gray line, but um, we could state that the platform will manage Kubernetes nodes and ensure that they have enough resources to handle the load. But again, the team's responsibility is to set the limits on their pods, et cetera, et cetera, so that if they get out of memory issues, it's more likely that you've set the wrong level on your pod rather than the um, Kubernetes nodes have run out of, uh, of resources. And whilst there are various other examples, um, we'll move on for uh, the sake of time. So the other thing, uh, the key thing that uh, you can do here is to favor automation and API driven interactions over human ones. And areas where we've seen this work really well is with onboarding. So getting new teams up and running in an automated way um, is, is great. So for example, getting uh, your sort of Kubernetes slice of the pie, if, if you're a new team that needs new namespaces and, and areas to work within, automating, automating that is, is, is very helpful. And of course, one of the main areas that a platform engineering team will help is around infrastructure uh, provisioning through infrastructure as code. So by way of some examples here, this will come in in different forms for different teams. So if you have a, an organization where there's a really high level of trust, um, it may be principle based. So you may say, well, as long as you use infrastructure as code, you can, you can go for it. So that, that's all you need to do. But I would say the majority of the, the organizations that, that we work with is that they, there is some level of restrictions that, that need to be put in. And so many teams will actually provide their, um, their, their teams or many platform teams will provide things like internal Terraform modules and, and things like that to be able to help the teams spin up their infrastructure. 
or as well as maybe even creating, um, uh, for example, Kubernetes operators, if, if that's one of the, the platforms that you work within. And this is an example, we actually did land up doing this in one client where we wrote a cockroach DB operator, um, and that enabled the, the actual teams to be able to create and manage new database and users within a global multi-region cockroach cluster. So by doing that, they, they were still actually operating within Kubernetes, but they managed to reach out into the cloud service provider, well, into a third party service in order to get that. So the area which probably, or the, the approach which I'd say works least well in this area, um, at least in terms of making teams independent of you, is where clients create their own custom level abstraction on top of the tools. So, Whilst it certainly can control uh, what can be done very well, it often leads to a lot of effort to maintain and can actually be quite restrictive. So I'd recommend you avoid this and just try and stick to standard abstractions like Terraform or, or something like that. So the last one here is um, just highlight is, is documentation. And I do think this is a little bit of a lost art nowadays, uh, but it is really important to ensure that people can help themselves. And it's not just restricted to textual documentation on wikis. Um, this includes making sure that you have up-to-date reference examples, uh, you know, for standard ways, maybe for deploying uh, microservices with Helm charts and, uh, and the like. And even if you, if you build tools for your, uh, for, for, your, for your engineers, making sure that they have simple things like auto-completion and um, uh, sort of helpful comments and things is key to, to making sure that they can do things by themselves without having to, to come and ask you all the time. So that was the first principle. The second community principle, whilst it may sound strange, I would say is to promote freedom over autonomy. So a little bit of a Greek lesson here. Um, I actually came across this on reading a separate book about saving truth, but um, the, the word autonomy actually comes from two Greek roots. Uh, so the first one is autos, which means self, and the other is nomos, which either means law or rule. So to be autonomous literally means to be like a law unto yourself or, or self-rule. And autonomy generally knows no bounds, and it often man manifests itself as a bit of a free-for-all. And whilst some people may disagree, I would argue that freedom is different. Freedom is often defined as being closer to the concept of liberty. And many argue that it needs some form of boundaries if it's going to make any kind of practical sense. So if we think of, for example, freedom of choice, this implies the power to choose amongst alternatives rather than being completely unrestrained. So when it comes to a platform, uh, what you really want to do is provide people with as much freedom as possible, but within some agreed boundaries so that everybody can play nicely together and it's, it doesn't land up being a, a free-for-all and a bad experience for the whole community. So practical things that can um, help here is, again, just to ensure that at least the ground rules are established up front. And again, this is something that can probably be done in your platform contract. And it just sets the scene for how any of the remaining decisions or the choices that are going to be made will work. So some of the common things uh, that we find are, are sort of the ground rules is things like, am I supporting a single cloud? Am I just in Amazon or am I aiming for a multi-cloud setup? Because the choices around tooling and everything would be quite different depending on, on what that answer is. Other things would also be like there may be uh, a mandate to only support the latest stable versions of, of some of the sort of tooling and technologies versus some of the latest stuff. But making sure that these are crystal clear will put all the other um, sort of choices into context. But the main tool here is really, as I said before, is to rather provide choice instead of an anything goes um, uh, offering. And some of the good examples that, that we've seen here with, with clients where they've done this well is around uh, things like technology stacks. So instead of, you know, sometimes it works, but in a lot of times it doesn't to say, well, you can just choose whatever you want and go for it. But giving people maybe a few choices to, to choose from, so you can say, well, you can either have a Java Spring Boot setup or you can have a Go setup or you can have Node.js or whatever the combination is. Having a choice from a few is, is better uh, and providing templates and reference implementations for those will be better than just potentially allowing a complete free-for-all. So the teams are constrained, yes, 
but they do have the freedom to choose among uh, the sort of options there within limits. So other things that we've uh, also seen in, in this area is to provide choice maybe around a specific ecosystem. So uh, again, by way of an example, if you look at the provisioning side of things, you can say, well, everything must be done through Terraform. So you can provision whatever you like uh, in, in the cloud, but it has to be done through Terraform. And this is probably because it will, uh, you may wanna enable easier multi-cloud maintenance. So this hooks back to the previous um, ground rules that we established before and says, as per those ground rules, as long as you use Terraform, you can, you can provision what you like. Or maybe you wanna deploy into, into Kubernetes, uh, that's also uh, an option. So a slightly different take on this is the concept of templated pipelines. So um, you may create some predefined CI CD pipelines, um, which kind of act like guardrails, but with specific jump off points that allow for the inclusion of different steps and tools, but the broad path and the broad sort of required outputs are set. And this would then allow for the inclusion of maybe common sort of checks and ensure that certain compliance uh, gates and things can be met. And this is a good example of how these type of actions can actually help to cater for the leadership and the governance community. So they may have um, you know, requirements around wanting to future-proof the ability to recruit and maintain staff. So by saying, well, we, there's a known set of um, stacks that you can use from that will allow them to do that, that, that well. But it also provides confidence in the system uh, because there's uh, data-driven means for acquiring maybe some of the testing, the compliance, and the security metrics by going down this path. So this is um, that's quite helpful from, from that front. So moving to slightly more softer skills area, um, I'd say that people are far more complicated than technology and putting as much effort into getting this side of the equation right is crucial uh, to ensuring a good platform experience. So our third community principle is uh, basically to aim to be a role model and walk the talk. But what does that mean? So as a platform engineering team, you should really aim to eat your own dog food. Um, so wherever possible, and sometimes it's not possible, you should try to use uh, the tools that you are actually trying to impose on others as well. So we had a, a project where we created a, a cloud broker type system, and that was going to sort of spin up self-contained environments for teams to work within. And we landed up using that same uh, template itself to actually spin up our own dev tools environment for running our platform services. And that highlighted all manner of issues, which actually helped to make uh, the experience better for the end users because we were actually using our own tools. Now, it's not always possible to do this. Um, and uh, what you can still do though is, um, as I said earlier, you, you wanna try and have maybe reference examples. So here's an example of how you can spin up a, a Spring Boot service with Helm charts, et cetera. And, by having these reference examples, you can create what's the concept of like an exemplar tenant on your system and use the reference examples to actually write your acceptance tests uh, for the platform against that. So the benefit of that is that you land up testing the, the, the reference examples and, and things that you're actually giving to your users, but at the same time, you're getting the reliability in the system as well. So, the other thing which um, is, is very much required, I would say, is to offer professional services to the team. And this will come in a variety of different forms, and it depends on the team's needs, but the typical things will include things like workshops, um, maybe even embedding different team members into uh, other teams for a while to try and help them out. So within an organization, a platform engineering team's responsibility is to make all the teams succeed uh, and work better. And unlike an external offering like Amazon or something, there is no uh, equivalent of the AWS professional services or some kind of third party service to call on. You as the platform team are the service uh, for your, the professional services team um, uh, that they will call on. And this again is something that really needs to be recognized by the leadership uh, and requires executive buy-in because time needs to, and effort needs to be set aside to actually allow for some of these activities to take place. Otherwise, um, it's, uh, it, it doesn't really work out so well. And finally, um, you may well need um, some kind of sort of platform evangelist or an advocate. And this is not just to peddle the latest sort of platform snake oil. 
but rather it's to try and explain and promote the, the benefits and the good practices that the platform uh, can provide to the different teams. So sometimes your principal engineers may double up uh, to sort of do this. Um, and this can be through uh, sort of, as I said, common brown bags, lunch and uh, share and learn type sessions, or even visiting teams to, to share the latest stuff with them. But the final, uh, the, the final one to, to really mention, uh, well, I guess at the beginning we spoke about having different teams and communities with different skills and, and levels and expectations on the platform. So the fourth and the, the final sort of community principle is to respect and recognize that there are differences in these communities and then try and cater for them appropriately. And uh, the way that, that this is often done is to adapt the ways that you actually work to make sure that they can be successful. So this will mean potentially changing your team structures and even the way that you interact with them. And as I mentioned before, this is why it's very key to have the executive buy-in because these types of changes can't be made um, uh, without that. Now, whilst there's many ways to look at this problem, um, Matthew Skelton and Manuel Pace uh, have done a great job in their book, Team Topologies, which I, I highly recommend. And without going into too much detail, they kind of talk about um, there are four main team types, which includes a platform team, and the three main ways that teams can interact with uh, different teams. So there's collaboration as a service and facilitating. And whilst I can't do the book justice, the, the sort of essence of the message is that if you want to promote fast flow, you need to mix and match between these different team structures and interaction modes as you progress along your journey. So how does this translate for platform engineering? So interaction wise, I'd say the platform team, in the platform team, your de facto model of interaction needs to be the as a service model because that provides independence. But there may be times when some of your, your team need to go and actually collaborate and facilitate with other, uh, with other members uh, or, or different teams. And again, this, is, uh, this will require potentially changes in structures to allow that. Something that we found on one of our last projects was specifically structure-wise in the platform team is that the platform team itself actually had to get decomposed into smaller specialist teams, one of them being to cater for the machine learning guys and the specialities that came with that. So that was looking at Selden and, and some of the stuff around that. But in, in all these cases, there's a movement of people and changes of processes, and this needs to be understood and expected uh, and allowed to happen. So just by way of a recap, um, we have the four sort of community driven principles that we've just looked at. And along with some examples of the actions which can be taken uh, for people to sort of help implement them. And I put them on a slide here, uh, one slide hopefully uh, for convenience uh, so you don't have to go through them all. So basically in conclusion, uh, I'd just like to say that if you're looking to establish a platform engineering initi initiative, which is fit for purpose, and it is able to target the communities that you, you need to serve, you need to start by having a good solid foundation. So make sure you've got your executive buy-in and technical expertise, but then guided by the community-driven principles that we've just discovered, take the actions and the decisions, decisions which will allow them to explicitly try and move towards a platform which has got these characteristics, clear boundaries, self-service, automation, flexibility, evolvability, and reliability. And hopefully, as we've seen with many of our clients, you should then be able to create a positive curated platform experience for all your communities. And that is it from me. Thank you.